you're talking about basically AI driven screening and how that speeds up the treatment, right? Or, or research and development. And to take for years to months is kind of the example you just um, gave us there. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe the origin of archetype um, therapeutics and how you guys came up with these models and, and what do you really think this type of screening, I know you gave the example already of years to months, but how is this going to play out over time? And by the way, just throw it in there. I love the drug repurposing uh, concept because I think that there are lots of molecules that are out there, lots and lots of them. And we've seen a number of efforts to do it that might do all sorts of things that, you know, people have kind of thought about, but just haven't been kind of the central way that they got to market yet. And there's just this enormous opportunity across that space. So maybe tell us a little bit about the screening and how you got there. And then a little bit more about what types of molecules you think are kind of best to use that approach for. Yeah, sure. So as you know, we talked a little bit about my background and my co-founder in this company, Paul McDonough, has a kind of parallel background, but he's the the hardcore scientist and the guy that developed the platform. So he was working on the completion of a human genome project 25 years ago. He was early at Rosetta Informatics where they were doing the gene expression work uh, in drug discovery a very long time ago, over two decades ago, working with pioneers like Eric Schott and others. And and also, and so he's cross-trained. So he did that type of work, but then he also did work in patient care associated applications. So there was work done at Rady Children's Hospital with Dr. Kingsmore. Paul was part of that team and they profiled NICU babies. So they did clinical genomic characterization of NICU babies who had rare diseases who were on the verge of death, essentially, and built this whole system to be able to take uh, a heel prick from the baby um, get blood from that, do a whole genome overnight, reason over that data and the clinical data, and identify what was wrong with the child and then identify whether there was a drug already available. And sometimes it would be something really simple like a B12, vitamin B12 deficiency. They saved a bunch of kids' lives. They won a Guinness World Record for that. So part of understanding how we came up with this approach that I'm going to describe is we have this kind of under-the-radar data scientist rock star in Paul that is cross-trained for 25 years across all of these different genomic and clinical data applications, both patient-facing as well as drug development-facing. And so that's where his ideation really came from. He started working on this idea about two and a half, coming up on three years ago, which was given all these new AI tools, including some of the generative AI tools, can we instead of being focused on the old school approach of discovering a target and then trying to find a molecule that hits that target, which is still a very valid way to do drug discovery, but you might be missing a lot of the biological picture when you just focus and narrow in on just one target. His concept was, well, there are these, what we just described a couple minutes ago, these human clinical genomic classifiers. What I mean by that, for those in the audience that may not be aware with all the jargon, is this concept of something like a Cologuard. So most people know what that is. That's the poop in a box test. You essentially want to get screened for the possibility of colon cancer. You provide this stool sample. They do expression profiling. What that really means is measuring the activity of your genes. And depending on the activity of your genes um, from that sample, you may be more likely to have or develop colon cancer. Well, those types of tests exist for all manner of diseases, including many cancers. And what they do is they predict the likelihood that you're going to have the disease or the likelihood that if you have the disease already, that you're going to have a bad or relatively good outcome in terms of how long you live or whether your cancer spreads and so on. So that's what we mean by clinicogenomic classifiers. And those are great to predict what will happen. But what happens if the prediction for you is that you're not going to have a good outcome? What if you're an early stage lung cancer patient and the prediction is, actually, even though we caught this early, you're not going to live very long or your cancer is going to be very aggressive and it's going to spread. What do we do for you? So great to have a prediction that helps doctors and patients think about how aggressive to be with treatment. But what if there isn't a treatment for those patients? So that was Paul's kind of original idea was what do we do for those people? And then he grabbed all the latest AI tools and said, well, what if we could predict for molecules that perhaps haven't been tested for this disease, what if we could generate the effect that that molecule would have on the biology of that disease? So how is it going to affect the expression of all the different genes that matter for the disease 
at once, not just one particular gene, so one target, but rather uh, a dozen or several dozen genes at once. If we could do that, then we could put that together with that understanding that we have from the human patient data and say, okay, let's take a, a molecule or let's take a billion molecules that look like drugs. People have built libraries of molecules that look like drugs, but you can't test all of them because you can't test a billion drugs. There's not enough uh, reagents and solvents in the universe to do that. So what we can do now is we can do that virtually. We can take a billion molecules in a day at this point, screen them all and say, what are they going to do to the biology of prostate cancer or colon cancer or lung cancer? And then project that information into these patient cohorts and say, if I could make these changes in these actual people, I would increase their lifespan by two years, for example. So that's how we do this. We've merged these two. One, that's kind of an older capability that's been around for 20 years, which is these classifiers in, in Cologuard and these other types of tests. And then these generative AI capabilities that are relatively new. We couldn't have done this five years ago, but these types of algorithms allow us to understand what billions of molecules, things that look like real drugs, but we can't test them all physically, what are the ones that are most likely to make changes to cancer biology that will matter for these patients and move their outcomes in the right direction? So that's the, this massive screening that we talk about. That's what we mean by that. And so we've screened billions of molecules in prostate cancer, in lung cancer, and we don't get some kind of esoteric readout. We get a readout as to what will that do for a set of patients that we know have on that medical need. And so once we have those answers, what are we doing? Well, we're saving all that time and expense on testing physically molecules that are unlikely to actually make a difference for patients. And so that's why when I mentioned that example earlier, why did it take only months to identify both drugs that people already know about as well as novel molecules that can work for this specific type of early stage lung cancer? The way we were able to do that is through that massive screening process that I described that happens virtually first, saves all the money and time so that we can focus in the time and effort and, and the use of the expert biologists and clinicians on the much smaller set of de-risked molecules that are likely to actually work for these patients. So when I think about what you're saying, like, it, and I just think about like my own experience, I started in computational chemistry and genomics, right? We were building libraries of, re, you know, what are all the molecules we could build if we have the following reagents and the following robot and like, let's just model those out. And then let's look at what we could make and was it drug-like or not? You know, we were trying to use certain characteristics that describe, you know, this looks like a drug or has the characteristics. So it was the Lipinski Rule of Five at the time was like the big thing. And could we make those molecules? And then we were actually working with pharma companies that had in their mind the idea that, you know, we're just going to make all the drugs and patent them all. We'll just own all the drugs before they even exist and nobody's ever tested them. Right. So there's a lot of effort around high throughput screening. So it sounds like we're taking the high throughput screening. There's a systems biology component that you talked about in my mind, which has always been, I think, you know, kind of a major issue. And it sounds like you're saying the AI tools are there. And the issue that I talk about is, you think about what we know about biology, I always feel like it's way less than we think it should be. Like we actually n understand biology much less than the actual, like the body is really complicated. These systems are incredibly complex, but it sounds like now with the tools that we have in place, we're able to either model the system's biology, right? Or maybe it's something that I, I think you, you might have said in here, which is understand from the real world data, from the actual patients, the patient centricity of what you know, even if we don't understand exactly what happens, what do we expect to happen when certain things change? And you're kind of meshing that all together with the result of taking the risk out of, like when you actually go and do something for real, then it's much more likely to be successful. Am, am I tracking this? Yeah, I think so. I mean, when a lot of the work back when I first met you and I was working with the folks at ATIA back when, when the company was called GNS Healthcare and, and Paul McDonough, my co-founder, was also there and we were early co-inventors of the technology there still working with those folks and, and, and love what they're doing. And we were very hyper-focused on kind of the detailed causal biology that we could learn from all the omic data. This approach is a little bit different in the sense that exactly as you just said, we may not understand all of the detailed mechanism underneath the hood, but if we understand 
what changes are associated with better outcomes for those patients. And if we can, in fact, induce those patterns in these people, the hypothesis, this completely different approach that we've adopted, is that we will enrich our hits. It won't be perfect, but we'll enrich our hits and we'll massively speed this up. So scale, speed, and relevance. Optimizing for all of those things at the same time, you're not going to be perfect at all of those, but we think that we've struck this right mix and we've kind of proven that by going through in vitro and now in vivo models that you would put regular drugs, going through a regular drug discovery process through and finding validation at each of those steps very quickly. So it's, and I would also say that there are a lot of AI drug discovery companies now tackling different aspects of whether it's target discovery, or I mentioned there are companies, even old school companies that have been at it for dozens of years doing structural biology or AI characterization of different types of targets or the admed and toxicity type aspects. So there's so many companies out there. I don't think we have all the answers, but we think that by trying to start with the patients and finding out what will move the needle, move them towards states associated with wellness, that we might be able to short circuit or get around some of the kind of length that you alluded to earlier in the conversation. And so far, you know, we have to bring some of these discoveries we've made into human clinical testing, but we're almost on the verge of that now, having gone through in vitro and in vivo studies that validate that the type of approach that we just talked about actually works, that you can start with a billion molecules that look like drugs, identify just a few that look good, uh, and actually prove out through the normal processes that every drug get, uh, gets put through the same paces and meet those standards. So that's what's exciting, is that this is now possible. And this is really hot off the press over the last few weeks that we've gotten some of the in vivo data, which is really kind of the metric that people look at to say, hey, this is cool. You know, cancer has been cured in in petri dishes millions, maybe billions of times. So the bar is a little higher than that, but we're starting to show that this is possible. 